Hello, my name is Elizabeth Bechard. I am excited to be with you today for this international advocacy workshop and to share some ideas about how to help families become more climate conscious. I'll start by briefly introducing myself. Again, my name is Elizabeth Bechard. I am a coach. I am the author of Parenting in a Changing Climate. I'm a senior policy analyst with Moms Clean Air Force, and I am the mom of six-year-old twins, Milo and Minnie. My contact information is here. If you want to reach out to me, uh, I hope you will. I want to dive in with sharing some of my own climate story. Uh, I've always been someone who was uh, environmentally conscious, you know, I tried to to do the right thing in terms of things like recycling and and just paying attention to what was happening to the planet. But the reality of climate change didn't fully land for me until 2018, when my twins were two years old. And I remember reading the uh, the headlines about the report that came out from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, that year. And this headline that you see on the right side of your screen uh, that said, we have 12 years left to limit climate change catastrophe, uh, really left me breath breathless. I remember uh, having this uh, intense climate anxiety and thinking, oh my gosh, my kids are two years old. Like I don't have, um, I don't have the ability to put this off until they're older. I have to figure out how to be a climate activist during their childhood, right? Because these 12 years are the years that they are going to grow up. And yet they're also the years that are going to determine the quality of their future. So I was experiencing intense climate anxiety because of what I was hearing in the news. Maybe some of you remember seeing these headlines that year. Uh, and of course, the headlines keep coming. Around the same time, just you know, weeks before the IPCC report came out, uh, Hurricane Florence hit North Carolina, where where we live. And this picture you see on the left hand of the screen is my twins in Wilmington, North Carolina, at a uh, beach uh, in Wilmington, uh, which was uh, where my grandmother grew up and lived her all of her life where my mother grew up and lived for a long time. So it was a beloved place for us. And it got hit really hard just weeks after this picture was taken by Hurricane Florence. And that was just weeks before these headlines about the IPCC report. So for me, that season was, was really um, uh, marked by intense worry about what was to come in the future about climate change, but also really realizing that climate change is here now. And we're feeling the impacts uh, all over the world. And so I'm imagining that many of you have felt impacts like hurricanes, like wildfires or heat waves. Much of the world has been experiencing heat waves this past summer, droughts. Uh, and so families all around the world are having these moments of, of waking up both to the, the very present reality of climate change, uh, but also worrying about what it means for the future. And so what does climate change mean for families? I, this quote from the, the Lancet Countdown on Health and Climate Change really landed with me. And, uh, you know, in 2019, the Lancet reported that the life of every child born today will be profoundly affected by climate change. And this is a graphic from the report that highlights just some of the ways that climate change impacts children's health. And you, you can see that the impact of climate change on our kids begins before they're even born now, right? So things like heat waves and, and air pollution uh, can affect pregnancy outcomes before children are even born, uh, causing outcomes like low birth weight, uh, preterm birth that can affect kids for the rest of their lives. You know, children are, are more vulnerable to heat related illnesses because their bodies don't regulate temperature as well as adult bodies do. And when disasters strike, you know, children are among the most vulnerable. And it's really important too that this graphic highlights the, the impact of climate change on teens and adolescents. You know, of course, they're also vulnerable to the health impacts, but the mental health impacts uh, are, are significant and, and growing. And it includes things like uh, the acute stress of being in a natural disaster, uh, such as a wildfire evacuation or a hurricane, but also the anxiety about what may be to come. And this is a graphic showing the results of a survey of 10,000 young people. This was also published uh, in The Lancet last year in 2021. It was a, a survey of 10,000 young people ages 16 to 25 around the world 
uh, asking them about how they felt about climate change. And the survey found overwhelming levels of distress among young people about climate change. As you can see here, a majority of them felt emotions like sadness and fear and anxiety. Uh, and extremely worried, right? About a third of young people in this uh, in this study are extremely worried about climate change. And as any parent who has uh, had a child with a physical health uh, challenge or a mental health challenge knows that you know when our children are struggling, it's an issue for a whole family. So young people's mental health uh, is a family issue too. And parents are worried as well. You know, unfortunately, we don't yet have the same sort of large database uh, asking parents about how they feel about climate change. Uh, but this graphic is from a survey of Chicago parents uh, that was done pretty recently, uh, asking them about their feelings about climate change. And you can see here about a third of Chicago parents who were surveyed uh, feel a great deal of concern about climate change and are very worried that, uh, that their family members, such as their children, uh, might be affected by climate change in the future. This is a graphic from that same survey that was done that shows that the more parents understood about climate change, the more worried they were. And this tracks with my own experience uh, that the more I've learned about climate change, the more uh, worry and concern that I felt. And so this is really important to keep in mind when we're thinking about how we help families become more climate conscious. We need to, to think about the impact that, it, that learning more about climate change might have on their mental health as well. And so what does it mean to be more climate conscious? So I wanna underline that there is definitely no single or best definition of what it means to be climate conscious. You know, what it, what it means to be climate conscious has a lot to do with, with where you are in the world and the level of privilege that you have. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Uh, but for me, just so that we have a working definition of this for the workshop, uh, being climate conscious means making choices with the health of the planet and future generations in mind. And this is a graphic that some of you might have seen. It's from um, uh, Earth Overshoot Day, which is a website you can visit that shows you know, that the date at which if, if everyone in the world lived like the people of individual countries, the, that the world would run out of resources. It's a really striking graphic. I live in the United States. Our Earth Overshoot Day is March 13th, which is barely a third of the way through the year. And so what it means to be climate conscious, if you're you know, in, a, in a country where the Earth Overshoot Day is somewhere in the early spring, might look very different from what it means you know, if your country has an Earth Overshoot Day somewhere in the fall, right? So the level of responsibility, I believe, that you know, people in countries like the United States have is, is much higher than many other parts of the world. And so how can we help families become more climate conscious? I'm going to talk about four ideas today. These are they're not the be all and end all of how we can help families engage, but these are the four things that, that I focus on when I, uh, when I work with families and talk with parents in my, in my own personal networks. We can help families cultivate emotional resilience. We can help them to learn about climate change. We can help them learn how to reduce harm and nurture ecological healing, and we can help families engage in conscious activism. So why is cultivating emotional resilience important? I think it's a, a foundational part of helping families to become more climate conscious because facing climate change requires that we face really difficult emotions like grief, anxiety, anger, and fear. You know, you've seen the slides showing high levels of distress and that the more we learn, sometimes the more distressed we become. And uh, this makes a lot of sense, right? We feel these emotions when something that we love is under threat. And that is, that is actually what is happening. So I, I believe that uh, emotions like anxiety and grief are entirely normal and appropriate responses to what is happening. And we should uh, embrace them as hard as that may be and, and help families to find ways to, to process them. 
And being emotionally resilient is a critical skill for individuals and families who want to play a role in the climate movement because the times ahead will be challenging. They are challenging for families, um, but cultivating emotional resilience can help us to remember that we can still have joyful and meaningful lives even within the climate crisis. And so what helps with emotional resilience? And I wanna underline that we don't yet have uh, a whole lot of evidence-based interventions for, for uh, navigating climate distress. And so a lot of these suggestions may evolve over time as clinicians and researchers learn more about what helps. But some of the things that have been named in the literature about what helps with, with cultivating emotional resilience in the face of climate change are things like validating, normalizing, and empathizing with difficult emotions, like we were just saying, you know, the emotions that we feel, you know, when we when we learn more about climate change are entirely normal. Uh, and making room for them with empathy is really important. Meaning-focused coping strategies. Uh, the idea of meaning-focused coping in the context of climate change comes from the work of a Swedish researcher named Maria Ohala. And meaning-focused coping involves uh, honestly and realistically assessing a, the, a situation that may be very difficult, in this case, the reality of climate change, but then looking to your own values and, and beliefs and, and inner resources and strengths to see, you know, what the silver linings might be, not in a sense of, you know, bypassing the difficulties of it, but, but seeing, you know, how can I show up for the way I want to be in this circumstance? How can rising to the challenge of climate change help me to be kind, become the kind of person that I want to be and live a meaningful life? A sense of community and belonging is really important in the literature um, that I've seen about parents and families and climate change. Some parents draw on a sense of spiritual perspective or uh, a sense of their own ancestral resilience to find strength in facing the climate crisis. It's really important for, for parents and families to have spaces to feel and reflect on difficult climate emotions. And some of the, the spaces that are emerging to provide that space are, are things like climate cafes and groups like the Good Grief Network, which are um, spaces that are that are designed just for people to have room to process their feelings and emotions about climate change. Time in nature can be healing. And engaging in collective climate action is also really important. So one of the studies that I have seen and loved uh, was done by researchers at Yale who were looking at college students experiencing climate anxiety. And they found that engaging in collective action, action with other people, um, helped to reduce depression symptoms for people who were uh, facing climate anxiety. And that individual action did not have that same effect. So. Uh, engaging in collective action with other people is not only good for the planet, it's also good for our mental health. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute. Learning about climate change is, of course, part of what it means for families to become more climate conscious. And I want to highlight uh, that how we learn about it is, is really important. So climate change is directly connected to all of the other social justice issues we're facing today racism, uh, wealth and income disparities, gender inequality, uh, all, of, all of the issues uh, are intersecting with climate change. And so, you know, when we're learning about climate change, it's important to learn about it from the lens of climate justice so that we uh, have a, a, a sense of who's going to be most impacted by climate change and how we can center their needs. Learning about climate change for families uh, also means learning about disaster resilience. And this can be uh, difficult to learn about. Uh, and I want to underline too that disaster preparedness should never be an individual responsibility, right? This is really something that governments, uh, country governments, state and local governments need to be um, in charge of. But at the same time, there are things that individual families can do to stay as safe as possible. And uh, when we're working with families, you know, helping to make sure that they know what they can do to be prepared for. Uh, the disasters that might um, affect their areas is really important. I've included a couple of links here for U.S.-based websites that can help families prepare for natural disasters, but uh, or unnatural disasters as we may think of them in the context of climate change. But there are resources all around the world for families on this front. 
And here's just one diagram from the National Center of Disaster Preparedness in the U.S. Uh, with questions that families can ask them ask themselves to to find out whether uh, they are prepared for the disasters that might affect their area. And you know, this is focused on the U.S. And um, I think what's true about the U.S. and and many parts of the world is that in every area has its own unique threats, right? So I I live in North Carolina, where the main threats that we face are hurricanes and heat waves and sometimes flooding, not so much wildfires, right? So um, in the in California and parts of the West Coast of the uh, of the U.S., on the other hand, wildfires are the primary threat. So understanding the the unique risks of your geographic area is really important and making sure that the families in your life uh, are aware and as prepared as they can be is really important. Another thing that we can do to help families become more climate conscious is to gently introduce habit changes and lifestyle changes that can help reduce our overall environmental impact and contribute to ecological healing. And of course, the changes that we make are gonna depend again on, on how much how many resources we're taking up in the first place. So thinking back to that, uh, that diagram showing the earth overshoot days for various countries. The diagram you see, or the image you see on the right here is from the UN Act Now campaign uh, with ideas that families can take to minimize the effects of climate change. And these are things um, that families can do at home, like saving energy, you know, using form, active forms of transportation, like walking or biking, uh, eating more vegetables, reusing, rather than continuing to just buy, buy, buy. That's, you know, very much a part of American culture to just keep buying. Um, and all of these actions have benefits beyond helping the earth, right? They can help us to remember our values and who we really want to be. They can help us to help our children uh, adapt to living more lightly on the earth and develop those habits from a young age. And there's also profound uh, mental and physical health benefits from some of these changes as well. I love this uh, diagram from the British Medical Journal that shows some of the health benefits uh, of making changes that are good for the climate. So just as one example here, active transport, uh, and of course that reduces um, greenhouse gas emissions because there's, you know, if we're riding our bikes or walking, there's fewer vehicles on the road. Um, but that's also good for our mental health to get time outside and exercising. It's good for our cardiovascular health and reducing overall rates of, uh, of chronic disease. So almost all of the changes that we make uh, for the sake of the earth uh, can benefit our physical and mental health as well. And engaging in conscious activism for families, I think is also a really important part of, of helping families to become more climate conscious. And so individual change and system change are both necessary for addressing the climate crisis. And unfortunately, they often get pitted against each other, but we really need both. And the way I think of it is, is that uh, when I'm working with a, a parent or a family who's trying to to be more climate aware, you know, I encourage them to start in their own homes, but then think of that as training for, for, for taking bigger actions that have broader impact. Um, but it's also important to recognize that, you know, many families are busy and overwhelmed and activism, it doesn't have to be big or heroic to be meaningful. Every little step that we take matters and it counts and it's, it's helping us to practice becoming engaged uh, in climate action. And when we do activism in a way that taps into our own unique gifts, strengths, and resources, it can become meaningful, uh, even joyful, and it can be a lot of fun. I want to share some ideas for what activism might look like for families. And to frame this, I'm sharing uh, an amazing diagram from a researcher named Elisa Mel uh, that she sort of mapped out this idea of spheres of influence. So, you know, we may think that as individuals, we, we don't have, we can't have much of an impact, but I, I don't think anything could be further from the truth. This diagram maps out all of the levels of influence that just one person can have, right, because of the, the ways that we are connected to different social networks and idea networks. And so... Some of the ways that families and parents can engage in climate action are talking about climate change with our loved ones, our neighbors, our community networks. So thinking about disaster preparedness, just as an example, talking to your neighbors to make sure that they have a hurricane emergency kit or a wildfire go bag, that's a form of, of climate action. Using our money 
to donate to climate justice organizations is a great way to begin to have a wider impact. Voting for pro-environmental candidates and encouraging others to vote um, is something that all of us can and should be doing. And that's something that kids can engage in too, even if they aren't old enough to vote. I remember uh, when my kids were, were very young, one of the first sort of forms of climate activism I was intentionally engaged in was writing postcards to voters in the U.S. to encourage them to get out to vote. And my kids um, from about the age of three could put the stamps on the postcards and, and loved it. It was just like stickers for them. So getting kids involved in, in many of these actions is possible from a young age and kids love to help. We can engage our schools, our workplaces and community organizations in climate action. Another example from my own family is that my parents have been working with their church to get their church to begin composting, right? So that's an example of how uh, individuals can uh, begin to affect these community organizations that we're a part of. We can advocate for climate-friendly policies at the local, state, and federal government level. And you know, if you're really ambitious, you can run for public office. I think we definitely need for more people who, who care about families, especially families with young children in public office. Creating art that helps to create uh, to change social norms is another really powerful way uh, to engage in becoming um, uh, more climate conscious. So many, so many other ways that families can uh, engage in climate activism. And I'm sharing a few images from my own family. These are my kids. They love art and they've really enjoyed making uh, climate protest signs and sometimes walking them around our neighborhood. Uh, so making it fun for kids is a great way to encourage kids to get involved in climate action. Um, and I would highly recommend, you know, if you've got families in your life who are wanting to get more involved in climate change, to, to find ways to get kids involved uh, as young as possible that are that are fun and empowering and engaging for them as well. I want to close by sharing some further resources. You'll see on the left side, a list of, of books. There are so many amazing climate books. So this is just the very tip of the iceberg of books that I think will be useful uh, for families. Uh, on the right-hand side is a list of family-focused climate groups. And the two on the top, Parents for Future and Our Kids Climate have an international network of groups. So no matter where you are in the world, uh, if you go to one of those uh, websites, you'll find uh, you'll find a family-focused climate group somewhere near you. Moms Clean Air Force is my own organization. I hope you'll visit momscleanairforce.org and check out the work that we are doing. And uh, finally, some resources for emotional resilience include climate cafes. Climate cafes are happening all over the world more and more. It's an emerging movement, and you can go to this website to find out if any are happening near you or to find out more information about how you might start your own climate cafe. And the Good Grief Network, uh, as well as an amazing organization that is leading groups to help people cultivate uh, emotional resilience and process uh, the really difficult feelings that climate change can bring up. And, and they regularly run groups that are focused on uh, supporting parents. So I hope that you'll check them out as well. And finally, to close, if you want to email me again, my email address is ebeshard at momscleanairforce.org. I hope that you will reach out if you have questions or want to connect. Uh, I'd love to connect with you and I appreciate your time today. Thank you so much.